Wisconsin's Public Service Commission is considering requests from utilities for large increases in the monthly charges paid by residential customers. If approved, these increases would cost homeowners and renters millions of dollars more, but how, how would they relate to how much electricity and gas, gas excuse me, consumers actually use? To give an overview of these increases, I want to thank Kira Lair, Executive Director of the Citizens Utility Board, William Skews, Executive Director of the Wisconsin Utilities Association, Inc., for joining us. Um, thanks. Um, Bill, perhaps start with you. Um, we are going to see a chart in a minute that shows some pretty significant increases. Can you give us the overview of why these increases, one of which has been approved and the others which will be acted on pretty soon, why, why are the numbers so attention getting, sir? Sure, okay, and by the way, Steve, thanks for having me on the show. Well, I appreciate it. Happy to come in and explain this. Uh, and obviously it is getting a lot of attention because when you say 82% increase on the bill, that, that tends to wake people up a little bit. And there's also a number, 140%, <coughs> that got my attention. But, but excuse me. But that's only part of the story. You're going to get to that. That's yeah. right. It's important to remember that there's a corresponding decrease in another portion of the bill. Okay. So what we have is a fixed charge cost going up by 82 percent, but also a decrease in the energy charge portion of the bill. There's two elements, and there's many parts of your electricity bill, but two main elements are this, the fixed costs, the pipes, the wires, the poles, the power plants. Those costs that don't change no matter how much energy that you use in a, in a month, those things have to be paid for under the fixed costs, and we call this the, uh, the customer charge on the bill. On the other part is the the energy charge, which is the actual how much the meter spins, mm -hmm. so this is the energy that you use each month, these things have gotten distorted so that too much of the, over time, the energy costs are being used to recover fixed costs. It sounds complicated, but what they're really doing is just switching them around somewhat so that we recover fixed costs in fixed charges and energy costs and energy charges. Overall, this should be they should cancel each other out with the exception of a slight increase in the just for the ongoing cost of doing business. Okay. Does that make sense? That's an overview. I've got plenty of questions, Kira, but I'm Cub was created when? Uh, thirty five years 35 ago. Thirty five years ago, just for situations like this. That's so give right. us give us an overview of Cub's position, please. Well, I think uh, your bill described the two components of the bill, uh, of a residential electric bill very well. There's a customer charge, a fixed component, and then there's, ver there's the variable energy component. But there has never historically been an actual relationship between what is considered fixed costs and what is considered a customer charge. In fact, we haven't really delved into what, what might be considered a fixed cost. And, with all due respect to Bill, we, Cub takes issue with what the utilities consider to be fixed because I think um, the way Mr. Skews put it is what's fixed is you don't change the number of power plants you have based on your usage in a given month. But over time, the number of power plants you have, the number of poles, the types of wires, the types of sizes, all of those things can change based upon usage. So we don't view those costs as fixed and view what should be more appropriately created or recovered under a fixed charge only those car costs that really don't change with usage, the meter, the meter that serves your house, the service drop line from the street to your house, administrative and general billing, those costs don't change based on usage, but the others do. Well, um, one of the, th I'm so glad you're here because one of the things that, I'm gonna ask a stupid question, okay? I can control how much electricity and gas I use, how much I can serve but I can't control some of these fixed monthly residential charges, correct? And that's what we're really talking about here. Do you, I want to give you a chance to respond to anything Kira said, Bill, anything? You know, th I guess those items are what the commission has to decide on when they take up these cases and uh, we can dispute within those fixed charges what are and what aren't. I, I guess I have to limit myself to speaking in broad policy terms on this. We've got three different cases that my members have in front of the commission right now, so I probably don't want to get into within each of those cases which are going to be fixed and which are not. But to your question about uh, controlling the energy costs that you can do each month on your own, mm -hmm. I understand your concern there. Um, you have to think about it as if you can control your costs, and let's say you're really working hard at conservation, at uh, being efficient with your use of energy. That's a good thing, and we, and we admire that and respect that and we encourage that. The difference here is that there has to be a minimum amount that we have to collect in order to get our costs collected for providing 
the poles, the wires, the pipes, the service to bring it to your house to make it reliable, affordable, 24-7. Okay. Um, so, um, does that okay. make sense? Well, I want to thank the PSC for giving us a couple charts or graphics here. So let's look at the first one. Um, this is from the PSC, and by the way, I asked the PSC representative to be here, and they said, well, the rate increases are pending. We're not comfortable doing that, and I think we all understand that. I did ask for a representative of your members to be here, and they said, wait a minute, the rate increases are pending, so thank you both for coming in. Sure. Well, um, in the case of MG&E for electric, 1044 is proposed up to 19, an increase of 82%. Natural gas, uh, 1217 to 2188, 80%. Uh, um, Bill, do you want to talk, uh, just uh, you, make any comments about uh, MG&E? Well, first, I'd like to thank Kira and her organization for dropping your opposition, at least uh, initially, it's where we are so far, to their fixed charge increase. Did I get that correct, that, uh, that Cub has dropped their opposition to that? Cub is not opposing MG&E's fixed charge increase, and we'll be actually be working with MG&E to talk about alternative models that the utility can use to collect revenue rather than placing things within the fixed charge. So we appreciate working with you on that as for one of my members. Um, can I ask, um, why, why has Cub dropped its opposition to increases of 82 and 80 percent, which are high? <laughs> Well, I don't, uh, don't see on here actually what MG&E's proposal originally looked like when they oh, came into the door. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, when they came in, I believe it was uh, an increase of the residential electric charge up to $22 in the year 2015 and then going up to $48 in the year 2016. And then they forecasted the potential to go up to $69 in the year 2017. So, Kira, what you're saying is $19 looks pretty good compared to 48 Exactly. By the way, um, how long are these, um, are, are your members uh, willing to hold these, th these rate increases at these levels? Are these guaranteed for one year, two year, three years, or that's another I think that's going to come out when, when the question. commission decides, you know, how long they'll be in effect, and that when a utility decides it needs to collect more to recover its costs, they bring another rate case before the commission. So I think that's going to be driven by, by the revenues that they are able to collect for their costs. Okay. Now and then. So Cub has dropped its opposition going from 1044 for electric and 1217 natural gas up to 19 and 2188 for MG&E. Just for MG&E. Okay. Thank you. Now let's talk yeah, about... Yeah, let's get back to your question. I'm sorry. I, I didn't answer the second part of it. Uh, go can, ahead. Can, can you remind me what it was? We, we kind of got sidetracked with the mg &E Well, one of my stuff. questions is, why haven't we seen monthly customer charges going increase... Uh, uh, being increases at lower levels as opposed to increases of 82 and 80 percent in one year. Why haven't we seen? I think gradualism, right? Yes. Why isn't this going well, after everything at, at no. once? Uh, is why, why, haven't, why haven't these increases gone up 6 percent, 7 percent per year? And why are we seeing a one-year boost of 82 and 80 percent in the case of, of MG&E? I see what you're saying. Okay, and I think Kira's right. Uh, it is it is a, a nod to gradualism. You don't want to go after everything right away. I mean, theoretically, 75 percent of the fixed costs are, are 75 percent of the of the costs on your bill are, are fixed costs, and this is really only recovering a portion of those. This isn't going after all of that 75. So, I think utilities are, are sensitive to how that looks. Obviously, it, uh, it, it, this, even this amount has gotten people's attention. So they're they're careful about not um, trying to do too much too fast. Okay. If, if I could address that a little bit, because this can. is, I think, it's a very important point that you've raised. The commission has a history of gradualism. They don't make sort of shocking changes. Like, for instance, with the utilities' profit levels, they've never taken increases or decreases in percentage terms like these. I mean, it's a gradual reduction or increase in any direction of, you know, just a couple of percentage points. And that was what was so surprising about these proposals is, like Webco's in particular, up to 75% in the first year. I, yes. We, we introduced a chart into the case that showed over the last 15 years or so, the customer charge has increased by a handful of percentage points. I think it was an average of four percentage points over the last 15 years. So the line looks kind of like this, and then you get to this proposal, and it jumps up like this. So it's, it's anything but gradual. I think that's one of our concerns, is that there's actually no crisis here. 
you know, Mr. Skews talked a little bit about the utilities need to recover their fixed costs. They're recovering their fixed costs right now, and the current rate design ensures that they recover their fixed costs as long as sales occur to the level that they forecast and expect them to occur. And if there's a change in the forecast, they can come right back in the next year and reforecast, and then the rates, even with a low customer charge, will still allow them to recover fixed costs. So there's no actual under recovery problem here. Bill, can, can I can I ask you a question this way? And again, this is not my area of expertise. Ask me any political question; I'm much stronger <laughs> on it. But. Um, <laughs> If your utilities want to come in seeking uh, increases 75%, if your members, excuse me, 75% and 80% this year, are they also saying as part of their rate app, we will not in the next year seek similar increases of 75 and 80%, or is that nobody? Again, I, I can't speak to that uh, on, on a broad basis. They may have that a different is what rate. Is they may that have is rate. That is what MGE is saying. Okay, they may have me. rate freeze provisions within their individual rate cases, and okay. uh, and and we can those could be broken down individually. But I want to get to something Kira said, which Please. and and she she was. Uh, I don't disagree with her. It's not an issue of under recovery uh, that's driving this at the moment. It's really an issue of trying to get ahead of what we see as a trend in the industry that's going on, on across the country right now with uh, some of the installation of distributed generation systems. So uh, folks have, for example, a solar array put on their homes and literally their meter spins backwards. So their contribution to the fixed cost, because their bill will be smaller, is going to be smaller and smaller. So in an attempt to get ahead of this curve, you're seeing utilities trying to set the paradigm up now so that when we do get more of these systems within the grid, mm -hmm. we'll be able to make sure that those costs are recovered and so that the folks who don't have those solar systems are not making up what the other solar customer isn't paying as a result of that. So part of this, part of the dialogue here is the expansion of uh, solar power on, on many homes. Well, distributed generation, including solar power. That's right? true. Thank you. Much better term. Okay, let, let's look uh, look at Webco. Back to chart one. Uh, they're seeking a uh, increase for electric of nine thirteen to sixteen dollars, seventy five percent. But they want a slight cut in natural gas from ten dollars and four cents to nine dollars and forty three cents. Do you want to talk to that before I give Kira a chance? Go ahead. Uh, your Cubs position on this one? We opposed it completely. We uh, provided expert witness testimony and, and cross-examined the utility in the case to show that the customer charge actually should not increase at all in that case. That the estimate for what we consider to be what might be called fixed costs was so low that it does not need to, the customer charge does not actually need to increase at all. Okay. Any PSs on that? No, I really don't. Uh, I think we're going to leave it in the hands of the commission, determine what is uh, the right balance of what the cost should be. And I think right now they're, they're on the right track with what they've shown with the WPS case. Okay, thank you. Um, the Wisconsin gas increase in, uh, um, yes, Wisconsin gas increase in natural gas back to chart one, 1004 to 943, a decrease of six. Cubs position, please. Okay. That was, we took no position on the gas case. Okay. Then the final one on chart one is interesting because WPSC, this is one that the PSC just acted on, correct? Yep. So um, the, the chart um, will, will show uh, the electric increase went from 1040 to $19, an increase of 82%. Cubs position on just that part? Was we proposed no change in the customer charge. They had sought an increase up to 140% and we yes. said it should stay the same. They sought an increase up to 25%. Um, yes, and uh, just uh, that part of it, Bill, any comment? Yeah, I would say that they, they saw that $25 would be at an approximation of what it would take to recover their fixed costs in that case. They didn't get everything they wanted, and nobody does in this process. That's, that's why we have a public service commission. Uh, so I think that what they did get is a reasonable uh, place to leave it, and uh, we hope that the commission continues that trend. Um, I asked Jeff Ripp of the Public Service Commission, and he just gave me the numbers, you know, they're, they're very objective because they're, we're talking about rate increases that are pending. And when you go from WPSC, go from 1040 to $19, just to show the impact, according to uh, Mr. Ripp of the PSC, that will cost customers $39.4 million more. Now, um, is that an annual figure? Do you know, Kira? I forgot to... It to should do... be an annual figure. Okay. 
Okay, just that, but the, just that one increase, 39.4 million, showing the the impact of some of these increases. Any PSs on that? Well, I think overall, as I looked at all three of these cases and averaged what they would mean on each customer's bill, because that's really what everybody wants to know each month, what's this going to be on my bill? That's graph two. Try, try two. Go ahead, Bill. <laughs> all right. Well, I don't want to skip ahead. But, no, but go ahead. I mean, remember the corresponding decrease in the energy charge. So I did the, I did the math myself. Now, look out. That, that's not something I do a lot of. That's why I'm in this business. But uh, the, a the average customer who burns about 600 kilowatt, uh, hours a month of, of electricity is going to see an increase of about $3.17 a month. So you can look at it in terms of $39 million, or you can look at it, the average customer, average bill increase is 3 bucks plus some change. Hold that thought. We'll get to the monthly because that's the next chart. But I, I want to deal with uh, WPSC's n uh, natural gas increase, 10.25 to $18, an increase is 76. Am I right in saying the PSC has not decided that one yet? They did decide that. Did they? Okay. What's I the, think that was uncontested. So. Okay. So you think it went to... Uh, what? We, ha we had proposed no change in the customer charge across the board. Okay. For electric and natural gas customers. The PSC then approved, uh, to the best of your knowledge, $18 there? To the best of my knowledge, yes. Okay. Now, let's go to graphic two. Let's talk about average monthly uh, uses, um, uh, costs, excuse me. Um, the average monthly uh, consumer here uses uh, uh, 600 kilowatts, according to the PSC. Again, this is a PSC chart. Um, Bill, uh, make, make your point. 2.3% um, increase for an MG&E, $2.26 a month. You're saying MG&E customers, that's reasonable? Is that basically your position? It is. Uh, yeah, it is our position that that's a reasonable amount. So this is in addition to what they're now paying for the for the for the non-usage, right? This is just the upper. This zero? is a, this is a little bit confusing because the average residential user, what these numbers are reflecting in terms of the two dollars and twenty-six cents for MG&E and the four thirty-one for Repco and the two ninety-four for pub service, yes. actually don't relate to the customer charge at all. They relate to the other part of the revenue requirement that the utility was seeking in the case. What Bill mentioned a little earlier about the general overall increase for increased expenses. Where the impact of the customer charge comes in mm -hmm. is on those who use less than the average. That's why their bill goes up so much more. Because what the customer charge does, increasing the customer charge, shifts who pays which costs. And what it does, uh, what the utilities proposal has done in these cases, if shift the cost to those who use less, less electricity from those who use more. So if you use less, your bill will be higher than if you use more. If you use more, your bill will be less. That's one of the reasons we're not fond of these proposals. Well, how can the average consumer or customer follow these very complex debates with numbers like these um, other than just sit back and write out a bigger check or allow their uh, bigger amount to be deducted from their checkbook. Uh, Kira, how, how can the average consumer follow this debate? Well, uh, many of consumers did follow this debate and they presented testimony and they arrived and presented at the public hearing and they submitted comments and they called and they wrote petitions and they participated in the process and I think that's important and I think more sh people should because it does affect their bills. It's confusing and it can get difficult to talk about but the fact is that if you use less energy and if you're trying to conserve and if you're trying to save money by l using less your bill is going to go up under this proposal. Bill, I have a confession. I just got my monthly bill and I threw away all the extraneous stuff and sent back the check. So I'm a poor consumer because I didn't listen to information in our bills telling me, alerting me, people like me, that hey, there's a, there's a rate increase that's going to raise potentially, right? So naughty me uh, <laughs> is... Well, I, I have to echo what Kira said. I mean, this... I, I do encourage people to engage in the process, and it isn't easy. I mean, I've looked at a utility bill. It's got very many different line items on it. And I will say this, though, that the Public Service Commission has made quite an effort to make it easier for people to weigh in with uh, Internet 
sites that you can go to. Every every company has their own sites that explain their different rate increases and, and decreases. And in fact, the companies do a, a heck of a job in outreaching to their customers to say, look, this is coming, here's why. You can go to the, the PSC website and weigh in with comments. And, and, and like Kira said, there were an extraordinary number of people weighing in in this process so far. So I think that's a good thing. It's a trend, but it's uh, it can become a little more politicized because it happened during this recent uh, election season, too. So I think people were already a little bit uh, sensitive. But uh, overall, um, yeah, it, it is easier to weigh in. It, it does remain kind of a heavy lift, though. But I want to come back to something you said, and correct me if I'm wrong. If these increases in monthly customer charges are approved, increases, then am, am what will my bill for electricity and natural gas go down? Will it be neutral indeed, sir? Well, it depends on where you are in that spectrum. I mean, I'm saying the average customer will see a, an average increase of $3.17 as a result of the increased cost of doing business. These are trying to, remember the energy charge and the fixed cost charge are trying to be brought back into balance, but there will, there always will, almost always will be an increase in just because the cost of fuel goes up every year, the cost of uh, wages, salaries, benefits goes up. These are the things that are variable costs, and they, they will go up a little. Is that a statewide average, $3.17? Th that's seven? those three cases. These average, three cases. Right. Your uh, Cubs position on it, do, do, you, do you agree with the estimate of $3.17, Karen? Yes, but it, it, that's for the average user, and the problem is most users, well, there are significant numbers of users who fall above or below the average. Yes. And that's what matters for these customer charges. If you see the $3 that is coming on your bill and you say, okay, I'm going to reduce my usage, I'm going to turn off the lights more, I'm going to turn down the heat, your bill is actually going to go up because of the customer charge increase. I see, okay. Reduce demand, higher, uh, please. I'd like to address that a little bit. And, and I, technically you are correct. Um, if the, the amount of savings that you would get by conserving is less, but they are still savings and they are just less savings than you would normally get. I did some more math, again, uh, warning on that. If you were to go from 660 kilowatt hours a month down to 450, say you cut your energy bill or your energy usage by 32 percent, mm -hmm. under the current plan that we have, the current rates that are in place, you would save about $29 and some change. Under the proposed changes, you would save uh, $28.35. I did the math and it came out to be a difference of 84 cents a month for that average user. And, and, uh, and admittedly, that's who we're, you know, I'm, I'm trying to stick with averages because this is a broad policy discussion on, on the issue. So, I mean, there are still savings. If you use less, you will still pay less. It's just that the amount of savings will indeed be smaller, slightly smaller. Any PSs? Well, I think it's, it's, it's not fair <laughs> to say that this is sort of a side issue. This is the point. Rates are designed to provide incentives, and so the rates have historically been designed to allow people the ability to control their bills, to manage their electricity usage, to then have to pay a lower amount each month. The, the purpose was if you want to uh, manage overall system costs, if you want to keep the system sized as small as possible, you want to be able to encourage people to use less. That's why this proposal that goes in the wrong direction. It actually encourages you to use more because if you use more, you'll save more on your bill than you would have before this proposal. And that's going to increase overall system costs in the long run if, if more people keep using more energy and then more power is needed to supply that greater electricity need. Well, I have another. We have been talking about the increase in the monthly customer charges on, for the residential user, homeowners and renters. So here's my question. Are the other types of users, the industries, the commercials, the ag, are they getting hit with the same proposed increase that, than me, the residential? Oh, okay, then my next stupid question is why not? Well, I, my members saw this as the best way to recover these costs in this case. That you know, I can't speak to it beyond that. That's what they felt they needed to get their costs recovered, and this is what they proposed. Okay, um, this issue again deals with the monthly customer charge, not which is not based on consumption. Um, 
When then, how often do your members submit increases in the actual rates of what they can charge for power and gas? Yeah, it really depends. It depends on what their revenue requirements are. To uh, it depends on how much they're collecting and how well they forecast it each uh, each year, each year and a half, each two years. Sometimes they can have a two-year rate freeze as a result of some decision by the commission. Sometimes they can come in for different uh, uh, recovery requests, such as for fuel. Uh, at within a year so I mean roughly you could say a year year or two that's how often these things come up is is there a national pattern here in other words are utilities in other parts of the nation trying to raise their monthly customer charges or is this just happening in the state of Wisconsin there are other there are other states that have been doing this and as Arizona for example specifically comes to mind because they have the same issue with the solar folks uh, they're trying to get ahead of that curve with the solar industry rooftop solar to avoid having those customers who don't buy solar panels foot the bill for those that do. So they tried to increase their uh, their fixed costs by, I think they got like a 5% increase uh, in November of last year. If we can talk uh, about that for a minute, because that's actually uh, a model that I, I sort of wish the utilities here had looked at a little bit more closely. The, the utilities talk about this is for solar. This is we have to avoid the the pen, you know what's going to happen when there's an increased distributed generation, and in Arizona, th where there is considerably higher increased distributed generation because the sun shines all the time <laughs> than there is here, they tailored their customer charge requests just to those who actually provide solar. I mean, if the problem is those who have solar on the roof, then address that problem. Don't bring the customer charge to every customer, every residential and small business customer in the utility service territory. Let's take a look at some of these issues in light of the national trends. Now we've all heard that w w America is producing more oil than it ever has, more natural gas, the Keystone Pipeline was just voted on today in Congress. Um, are these is there any linkage or synergy, Bill, between these these proposals, the increase in customer charges, and the overall national energy picture, sir? I would hesitate to try to draw a link between fossil fuels for other purposes and then home energy use. I, I really am not in a position to do that. I represent the investor-owned gas and electric utilities, so okay. uh, I would be stepping way outside of my expertise to try to link this to Keystone Pipeline. Your thoughts, Karen? I, I uh, don't see too much of a tie to any national issues like the Keystone Pipeline. I mean, what, what increasing the fixed charges does is it stabilizes the utility's revenue stream. It makes it easier for them to collect funds from customers. And because it also has the side benefit of encouraging increased electricity usage, and that's how they make their money. They make their money when they sell more electricity and then when they get to build more new generation to supply those increased electricity needs. So it makes sense from their perspective as to why they would want to create as, as high a fixed charge as possible. Well, you understand my question. If I'm paying, I paid 295 for gasoline today, so yay, and now we're looking at it. But anyway, if there's no linkage, so be it. But what about the EPA draft announced in March? 30% increase by 2030 in coal-based emissions. Is that part of the long-range planning by your customers that we see in these, in these rate increases, Bill? I wouldn't want to mix those two yet. I, I, we're still looking at ways that we're going to be able to comply with those, those uh, greenhouse gas regulations that the EPA uh, uh, have handed down and frankly we're, we're a ways away from actually putting a proposal out there. We're working on it closely with uh, all the stakeholders but um, I wouldn't say that yet. What's the position of your of your members? We're still working on that. Okay. We're, yeah, we are as an industry we're collaborating with other other uh, providers and with the customer groups and with the manufacturers so um, that's a work in progress. Has Cub taken position on the clean, clean air uh, draft of the EPA? We haven't taken a position on the draft itself. We've expressed our desire that the ability to comply with it come in the most cost-effective manner possible. And, 
And one of the items that we see as a cost-effective way to comply with the 30% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions is energy efficiency, you know, being able to replace the windows at your house, replace your refrigerator, and then overall reduce your electricity usage to reduce the number of power plants that need to run that, re that emit those kind of emissions. And that's why this customer charge proposal makes that even harder. So I think we're setting ourselves up for difficulty in complying with the greenhouse gas rules as well. Okay. Well, um, any any PSs well, there? I, you, yeah, I would. You, add you, the PS. you look like you were stirring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would just add that uh, we need to get credit for what we've done in this state already on conservation and efficiency as part of the one of the four building blocks that the P, that the PSC is uh, using to comply with what the EPA has suggested. One of those is energy and efficiency and. Um, we want to get credit for actions that we've taken, early actions we've taken as responsible citizen uh, corporations to, to reduce emissions so far. And that's been a point of contention with, uh, with the regulators versus the, uh, the sources right now. That's one of those parts of the discussion that's ongoing. But we have been uh, in the same stakeholder meetings with Cub and with uh, the other customer groups working on this together with the state as well. There are many issues in the next session of the uh, ledge and in the next state budget, but one of the issues is our new state renewable, renewable energy standard. What's your uh, industry pushing for in terms of that? We're not pushing for anything. We think the current 10% standard, which has been pretty expensive but worthwhile to meet, is adequate where it is. Uh, the PSC chairman tells me we're already there, correct? We're there and in fact in exceeding it in some places at some times. Okay. So uh, that, took, that took quite a bit to get there and it's something that we worked on together with stakeholders. It wasn't opposed by our industry. Uh, I think it voted, it voted unanimously through the legislature with, with one one exception. Right. Uh, so we think 10 percent is, is a good place to be. There have been proposals last session to increase it to 25 percent to 30 percent. There was one proposal to completely eliminate it. Uh, there was another proposal to include nuclear as part of the, the mix to get you to 10 percent or to 25. So I mean it's been all over the board and the problem with that is if you have these different proposals as political realities change. You whipsaw public policy back and forth for an industry that really requires a lot of long-term planning. So we want to stay at 10%. It's, it's hard to create certainty in, in the business world by taking 0 to 30 back to 10. It's just not a, not a good way to run public policy on Cubs something so big. Excuse me, thank you. Cubs position on the, the, the next uh, energy standard? But we don't have any particular position on our renewable energy standard. We want to look at more comprehensive planning, particularly in light of the greenhouse gas regulations. And I think, I think new re renewable energy is going to be an important part of complying with those rules. And it should always be a, a, a part of the generation portfolio mix. But I'd rather look at issues more holistically rather than on a piecemeal basis. You, met, you use the N-word, nuclear. Is it time that our prohibition against nuclear energy be uh, repealed, Bill? You know, our members don't have any plans to build any nuclear. We got out of the nuclear business. But uh, as far as a public policy to meet these greenhouse gas emission requirements. I think everything has to be on the table and we would probably be okay with looking at the moratorium in Wisconsin that says you can't even can't even talk about this. I think that's that binds the policymakers hands too much and we would probably support repealing the moratorium. Okay. The Cub's position on the nuclear issue? The Cub would be adamantly opposed against that. The utilities did just divest themselves of two nuclear plants and they are incredibly expensive. As I mentioned, we're looking for the cost-effective ways to comply with the greenhouse gas regulations, not the ones that will continue to drive rates through the roof. Okay. Let's close the show this way. Um, residential customers who are about to see an increase in their monthly fixed charge, separate from how much electricity and gas they use, what should they understand, Bill? Well, the utility business is largely a, a fixed cost business, and um, we've got these charges that pay for the pipes and poles and wires. We've got these charges that pay for the energy. In order to make sure that the utilities recover those costs and are able to bring you reliable, affordable service 24-7, we've got to make sure that we can recover those costs. Um, remember that the, there's a balance here and we're trying to make sure that these things we get ahead of these issues before there's too much distributed generation on the system so that everyone pays their fair share for the use of the grid. Okay, Kira, last word. It's, uh, 
it's not fairness when those who are using less need to be paying more. The utilities should seek, get recovery for their fixed costs, and they do right now, and their rates do not need to change in order for that to happen. Very good. Kira Lair, Bill, Bill Skews, thank you so much for trying to make a pretty com complex subject understandable, and maybe the next time I get my bill, I should read all that extraneous. <laughs> uh, thank you both so much. Thank my you. pleasure. Thank you.